So today my talk is about using the um, protein conformation array for therapeutic map development. Um, so in the talk to cover today, I will first talk about why we need a new technology in um, this area. And then I will briefly uh, introduce on how we develop this technology. Then I will talk about the bridging studies we use from our original ELASA-RC to the XMAP. And then in the fourth part, I will talk about using this uh, new technology to study the immunogenicity and uh, how all the structure correlation and finally the conclusions. So, why we need a new technology for protein confirmation analysis? Well, first of all, um, for the biotech market, we know that we have a very rapidly growing market. So the biotech growth is, rap is about two to three times faster than the small molecule. So from one of the data, um, by 2020, there will be 70 um, by, um, biologics, mainly maps, improved with a revenue of about 125 billion. So this is a very huge and rapidly growing market. And uh, so there is definitely a need for um, new technologies to meeting this um, fast-growing market. Here is a uh, snapshot from one of the company, Pilar Lidi. And uh, those marked are the biologics, uh, mainly maps. So this is actually true for many of the larger biotech companies. So here are uh, uh, a partial list of the maps that approved on the market. And as you can see, there are many um, blockbuster biotechs, um, biologics. Actually, one of the best seller, Humira, is expected to get uh, $18 billion sales this year. So it's equivalent to 18 different blockbusters. So that's showing the high potential for the biotech. Uh, and for the biotech industry. So here is a diagram of the typical um, biologics development process. So it started from the so it started from the discovery phase, and then it got transfer, um, transformed into the development stage where a transitional cell line will be developed into a stable cell line. Then, um, in the analytical part, there will be a lot of studies to help to select the right molecule, right process. And of course, in the clinic, there will be many uh, analysis there to ensure the drug safety and efficacy. So in the bioprocess part, there is the upstream, that different days, different skills of culture, and then downstream, different columns for the biologics for the map purification. Then after you get the drug substance, that going into the formulation department for formulation de development so that you can get a stable, efficacious, and a safe um, drug. So what I want to emphasize is that uh, this technology we are developing actually can interrogate and bring value to the customers all the way from the discovery to the analytical by process and the formulation development. Okay. So one of the reasons that we develop this technology is um, from the biotech and the regulatory agency like FDA, we all realize that there is a need for better uh, high order structure analysis technology. So here is a, a statement from FDA in a guideline for bisimilar development. So in this case, uh, the FDA stated that uh, the 3D conformation of a protein is an important factor in its biological function. However, at the same time, a protein's 3D conformation can often be difficult to define precisely using the current technology. So actually from both the biotech and the regulatory, there is a recognition that we do need a better technology in defining the high order structure for biologics. 
Here is a comparison of the different technology we are currently using uh, for the um, biologics high order structure. Basically, the typical message is that the PCA technology that we are developing now can provide a more CGMP friendly, more sensitive, and high support capability. And that is actually uh, overcome uh, almost all the technology currently used um, for the biology development. So in the second part, I'm going to briefly cover how we develop this technology. So the concept of developing the PC technology actually is very, very simple. It's based on the immunology epitope scanning. But in this case, we just reverse the sequence. So instead of using, instead of using the overlapping peptides to identify the epitopes on the uh, defined uh, antibody, now we are using the peptides to produce antibodies. And then using that antibody again to probe a defined biologics like a monoclonal antibody to see what are the epitope distribution on the surface of the map. So we will synthesize overlapping peptides and conjugate each peptide to a carrier protein like a carrier H and make a polyclonal antibody. So the reason we use polyclonal instead of monoclonal is because when you probe a map, the map the conformation is in a constant equilibration, it's not a concrete structure. So if you produce a monoclonal antibody toward each epitope, then if the map, the certain area has a slight bond bend, you will lose the detectivity. But if you use a polyclonal antibody, so the peptide we designed, each one is about 30 amino acids, and we know from immunology that it takes three to six residue of linear amino acid to produce a viral antibody. So when you use this certain amino acid peptide, you can potentially produce multiple antibodies. So in this case, whether you have a bending or change of those certain area on the map, you still have certain antibody to detect and quantify the changes. So here just a diagram of the antibodies we're producing. Basically, it covers the whole map sequence. So we have 34 antibodies, cover both the available region and the constant region of the whole map. So the original format is uh, a glass assay, and uh, I will not go into the details. So basically, capturing antibody, uh, incubate with your sample and form a complex. Reporting antibody is anti human IgG, which is body conjugated, and uh, by a colometric reaction, you will report how many complexes are being captured. Uh, this is in the 96 way of your last assay. So, this diagram is available region for some of the maps on the market. So each map they have this signature profile for their sur uh, surface epitope exposure. Right now, uh, this assay is being developed mainly for comparability analysis, and later on, uh, there is a potential that this assay can be further uh, developed into an ID test, which is more precise and high throughput as compared to mass band. So and another feature of this technology is it is a multifaceted technology, so it can provide a fingerprint-like profile for each of the map you're interested in. The reason we say that is when you stress uh, any sample with any of those stress conditions, any of those, we can detect differences. There hasn't been any exception. So that means that in the by process development, whether you have a deviation in the temperature, pH, or glycination, those can all be reported precisely by this technology. And there's no other technology can claim this. So here is a very example where a new map is being developed by a leading biotech company. So in this case, they reported a 22% potency acid decrease. And then when they use the PC technology, in the variable region in the larger chain, 
uh, CDR region, they detected a significant change in the high order structure. For the same molecule, in the stability study, they reported a 64% decrease in the FC gamma binding um, change, and uh, consequently, when they use a PC technology, especially in the FC gamma binding side, there is more than tenfold change in the high order structure. So, by doing the PC assay now, you can build this correlation between the potency or the amino binding activity versus the structural differences. So, the scientists can use this to either improve the molecule or their process. So you can interrogate where the deviation are being introduced. Is that starting from the cell line selection or it's actually introduced in the by-process or in the formulation? So now you can answer those critical questions. So this assay is very sensitive. So here is um, building the 34 different edible the standard curve. And uh, as low as 0.05% change on the surface epitope, we can actually quantify it. So many of the current technologies, the sensitivity are either like 5% or even 20%. So it's not even close to the uh, sensitivity and accuracy of this technology. So here are the current uh, products being available for the majority of the bisimilars um, that is a uh, different company working on and uh, also there is one uh, inner bridge that has been developed for new map development. Here is a, um, um, so this is a publication from Celtron and uh, Celtron is a bisimilar developer from Korea and they have the first bisimilar been proved in the world, first in Europe and then in US. So in their application, they use the PCA data um, to, for the filing and, uh, and eventual approval for the LMK. And they also actually, in the subsequent development, also use the semen data for their herceptin and the rituximab um, um, filings. So um, briefly, this technology can be used in uh, different areas of bioprocess development, starting from uh, cell line selection. That's where actually the most value being uh, realized. So if you use this technology, especially in the biosimilar development, you can quickly, even from the uh, code extract, tell whether your molecule from your cell line is similar to the, the innovative molecule. So that really saves the downstream cost if the molecule is very different. And we do have cases where some of the biosimilar developers have a molecule that is showing significant difference, and then that product has to be stopped and then restarted from the cell selection. So it realizes a great value by using this technology in the bioprocess development. And it can be used in formulation development, compound based study, and also in the ADC development. So now I'm going to talk about the breeding study for this technology from the traditional elastic assay to the XMAP. So here is a, this is a collaboration between Ali Bridge and the Millipole Sigma. So uh, Dr. Wen Lee did this work. And in this case, she build a product in two different formats. One is to combine the 34 different beads, addressable beads together. So this will call the whole map molecule. In another format, she separates the variable region, 12 antibodies, and the constant region, this is another 22 antibodies. The reason she did that is because uh, she wants to see whether the combination of the the mixing of the 34 different antibody will have any interference. And uh, so the results are showing that uh, in either format, there is no um, noticeable interference from the, complex, for, from the mixing of the beads. So here is the bridge study, when the bridge study, there are a long list of bridge studies. So here just provide some examples. 
So in this case, the upper panel is the last acid result, and this is um, um, XMAP34 uh, complex. So basically, the profile is very similar, except that the uh, XMAP has a wider dynamic range. So for the last acid, as we know, when the reading close to the first three is already been saturated, so you really cannot quantify those changes in the high order structure values in the X map because the height, the wider dynamic range, you can still quantify. So it gives you a more accurate estimate of your sample's high order structure changes. This is a, a real sample we tested. So this is a latoximab tested, um, um, so it's a typical uh, minimum batch uh, as required by the FDA, so three batches from the innovator um, from each of the intended uh, market, in this case three is from US, three from Europe, and three of their own. So this is the comparability analysis, so you can see that uh, this is available region, um, is very similar between the two formats. Constant region, uh, also again, very similar pattern um, when you compare the elastic RC versus the XMAP um, output. And then this is a CH2, CH3 domain of the heavy chain. Again, um, very similar. Um, profile. There are some minor differences probably due to, you know, we're using a different physical setting, but uh, for the most part, it is quite similar. So this is um, one of the publications from uh, BMS. Uh, in this case, the scientist used the uh, XMAP format to process their by-process samples. So in the biotech, there are two lines that where a large number of samples being produced. One is in the bioprocess uh, development, another is in the formulation development. So this is one of the areas that BMS used. So in this case, um, what they found is that this technology, the PC technology, generated data that is very um, uh, correlated very well with other uh, technologies other technologies that the people use in the traditional way to uh, study high order structure except that the PC technology is more sensitive and more precise. So here is an example. This is an um, in-process, in-by-process sample that we tested those other IgG4 molecules and showing the response of the high order structure where you have uh, um, by process deviation or changes in the condition. So as you can see, um, going from the YAS RC to the XMAP, there are definitely advantages. Um, you know, sample consumption, uh, high long time, you know, high automation for the XMAP, and very fast, high precision and also a wider dynamic range. Uh, in the, the next section, I'm going to talk about the immunogenicity and how all structure correlation study. So we know that in the small molecule world, we have this called the SAR, structure activity relation. This is a very important path toward developing a successful drug, right? But in the larger molecule part, we don't have a tool up to now to study how the molecules in genesity is correlated to its structure. So now we have this precise, very accurate technology. So that made it possible to study really how your structure changes are related to immunogenicity properties. <coughs> so basically, we use, um, so this is the design of the experiment. So we're testing three molecules. Um, one is uh, the RGG derived from the human serum, and uh, another two are the marketed uh, product. Um, one is the uh, latoximab, another, oh, I'm sorry. This is, so this is, this is the research uh, demonstrate uh, the correlation between the high order structure and the immunogenicity. 
So this is just a basis of the, the study. And this is just the consequences. When you have amygdalicity, you can uh, have a loss of the efficacy, or you can have potentially a, uh, an overdose or some other issue. So in the biologic development, amygdalicity is a major focus of the safety concerns. OK, so here is the design. So RGG is from the human serum. And then two maps on the market. One is Herceptin, uh, which is showing very safe and uh, with, uh, with very um, low level of immunogenicity. And now this is uh, which have been showing in many publications, it has clinical immunogenicity issues. And uh, we use uh, different treatment stress conditions and different levels from 100 microgram all the way to one microgram. Basically, that is mimicking the level of the biologic maps into the human body. So when you first inject, um, in the beginning, you can reach as high as 100 microgram, and then gradually will decrease to as low as one microgram. So for the cytokine um, release testing from the human whole blood, well, we used uh, uh, Millipore, the 21 cytokine panel to report, but in the result, we only um, summarize 11 because to express, <coughs> express the whole 21 is very crowded, you almost cannot read uh, in a slide. So here is a high order structure readout from the IgG developed from the human serum. We stress in different conditions. I will not go into detail, but so this is the high order structure part of the data. And this is the cytokine release data. This is the average. So the point I want to make is that uh, the IgG uh, from the human serum is immunogenic. And that is not really surprising because um, when you have this uh, human IgG from the hum from you know, commercial source, that is very different from the, the donor blood because the available regions are different. So the, the human broadest uh, immune system will think that all those RGG are foreign molecules. So that, will, that is the reason you elicit those uh, cytokine release. So there's, so there's a dose-dependent uh, cytokine release. And then we found that uh, if you use urea to unfold the map, you can diminish the cytokine activity. And if you use the heat treatment, also you can decrease the immunogenicity, and that is also corresponding to a, a specific feature in the high order structure changes. Another point I want to make is that different donors responding to the same treatment differently. So there is a polymorphism in the immune response. So that is important when you study the immunogenicity you are not looking for the average. Some of the signal may be averaged out. So you need to look at the individual responses to see you know, whether a specific molecule or a specific treatment can induce cytokine release. This is ratoximab. As I said, ratoximab itself has a witness issue has been reported already in the public. So one point I want to make is ratoximab, even without any treatment, she already has a substantial epitope exposure, linear epitope exposure. So whether this linear epitope exposure is, has anything to do with epigenicity, we don't know, but we just notice that correlation. And also, when you stress the sample, uh, they have structural changes in different areas uh, with different stress conditions. What is interesting <coughs> when we use the PC technology is that we found there is a we call the high order structure polymorphism. So when you look at the Latox map and the Herceptin, they're both from Genetic, uh, the constant region are identical. So there's no difference in the amino acid. So the large chain constant region, the heavy chain, CH1, 2, 3 domains, they're all identical. However, when you look into the constant region of these two maps, the high order structure difference, the structure stability is very, very different. Okay? So why? Because it shares the same amino acid sequence, but the structural stability is very different. 
So what that telling us is that there are something that we don't know yet is impacting the map high order structure. So we found that that is a very interesting uh, observation. And this is a study of the subcan uh, from Rotoximab. So in this case, as you can see that the three, the three levels of the, uh, of the Rotoximab will be tested from 100 microgram to 1 microgram, they all elicited high level of subcan. So even as low as one microgram, you already have a very high, high level of subcan release activity. So that means that it is not the encoded portion of the latoximab. It's uh, some common feature of the whole population that is correlated with the subcan eliciting property. So there's no, there's no dosage-dependent correlation in this case. Again, different individual responding differently. So you need to look into the individual response to um, evaluate the immunogenicity issues. And uh, so I mean, because of time limit, um, I didn't show the Herceptin result. Basically, Herceptin has a baseline in genetic, so very, very clean. So that can be used actually as uh, a negative control. So for the conclusions, uh, adequate allergies developed against the 17 marketed uh, biologics and the one for a new map. Each antibody array provides a unique high order structure signature for that map. It's reflecting the linear amplitude of exposure on the surface of the map. So that is where the original information is extracted. And it provides uh, good sensitivity, systematic coverage, and relatively high throughput. And also, it's created well with stabilizing the bias data. And sometimes it can detect changes that may not be detected in the bias. Because in the bias, you mainly are interrogating in the variable region. So the constant region, especially the CH2, CH3 domain, are relatively separate because of the hinge, right? But for this PCAS, because it cover everything, so where the bias cannot, cannot detect differences, the PC can detect, so it's a complement to a certain level to the bioassay potency assays. And it can be applied to many stages in the bi biological development. The XMAP format offers a high throughput and uh, dynamic range. It has a similar sensitivities compared to the last assay, a little bit higher, but uh, many is more similar. And also it has reduced the cost as compared to the last assay format and it has been successfully applied in the bioprocess and also in the formulation development uh, through some of the customer testing. And finally, I would like to thank the people who contribute to this study uh, from Allen Bridge, Mark Davis and the Gofen Fu provide high order structure readout, and from Milipo Sigma, Wen Rongli, uh, Bob Case, Xiao Qian, uh, Mike and Lawrence all contribute to this work. Thanks for your attention.